let me bring this debate, uh, this discussion down to one part of the world. I don't want to use the Middle East because, in a way, that's too easy. You know, we, we know the horrors of the Middle East. I want to use East Asia. And the reason is East Asia has gone under an economic boom for decades. It's had mass education, women's rights, uh, it, the feminization of culture, almost everything that Steve writes about, you can see in East Asia from Japan to Australia. So what's the result? One of the greatest arms races in history now, even though that the New York Times and others are not really covering it very well. Um, Japan is coming out of its quasi-pacifistic shell to become a real military power. Nationalism is on the rise in Japan. Jap the Japanese Navy is four times the size of the British Royal Navy and much more deployable with niche operation, with niche capabilities and submarines and special operations forces. China, since the mid-90s, has built a great Navy and Air Force. Everyone, the Vietnamese, the Chinese, the Malaysians, they all have a shop-till-you-drop policy on the acquisition of submarines, both nuclear and, diesel, and the latest diesel, quiet diesel electric. The Australians, with a population about the size of Canada, are putting an extra $20 billion just into fourth and fifth generation fighter jets and new submarines. There is a vast arms race going on in East Asia. Um, the Chinese are going to have more submarines deployed in the water than the United States in about 10 or 15 years. Nationalism is alive and well throughout the Indo-Pacific, from India eastward all the way up to Japan, um, and a very virulent nationalism, which is the direct result of the economic development and the mass education and all of that um, that's been going on. It's, um, it, 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 it's really stark. You see it in public demonstrations. Uh, and when the Chinese tell me in Beijing they would love to compromise on the territorial claims they're making in the East Sea and the South China Sea, they tell me we can't because the nationalist genie is out of the bottle and the party is afraid. Um, the party is afraid to compromise so that it can. And what are people fighting over? Not even islands, but rocks that are under the sea during high tide. Um, and yes, these rocks may have oil and natural gas around them, but it's a contest for status, for king of the hill. Um, that's, what, that's what I see it as about when I talk to people there. And I'd like Steve to comment on that in a, in a little while, because the contest for status is still very much alive in the human psyche. And remember, we're talking about East Asia. We're not talking about a poor part of the world where there are tribes fighting or this or that. We're talking about people who have bullet trains, who go to work in suits and ties, and who totally support bigger and bigger defense budgets. In terms of prognosis in, uh, for the future, rather than just playing out scenarios in your imagination, which I think is a very fallible way of method of prognostication. And uh, I have a whole list of predictions of wars deemed to be inevitable that never happened. Because, uh, and here I'm going to speak as a psychologist, uh, recalling anecdotes, visualizing scenarios is extraordinarily unreliable. It's a reflection of the imaginer's own psychology. It's a, it's a reflection of how vivid events are, how many inches of column space they get, how big a, a bang they make, uh, but it doesn't take into account factors that really do predict uh, war and peace. And uh, two different studies that look both at probability of great power war based on predictors that have had a successful track record in the past, like democratization, trade, membership in international organizations, relative power, and so on, uh, have, have suggested that the chance of a, one by uh, Bruce Russett and John O'Neill, shown that the probability of a war involving a great power has uh, never been lower. And another study from the Peace Research Institute of Oslo that looks at the world as a whole rather than just the great powers 
uh, again, shows that if you look at what all the different factors that statistically correlate with war versus peace in the past, they predict that the chance of war worldwide will, will continue to get lower and lower over the next few decades. I tend to put more stock in that kind of analysis than just, well, I can imagine such and such happening, which I consider to be, uh, I, and I think the historical record shows to be uh, pretty worthless. Thank you.